We already talked about MSI's penchant for bloatware in our previous MSI GE727RE laptop coverage, but today we're reviewing the laptop in full, and we won't really be talking about the software since there's a fully independent video just on that topic. This laptop has a 1050Ti, a 7700HQ i7 processor, and is priced at $1,200 to $1,300, which makes it an interesting candidate for what could be a smaller form factor notebook for gaming, but ends up being a bit larger at 17.3 inches. Before that, this video is brought to you by Corsair's new Vengeance RGB LED RAM, which ships with custom screened ICs for better overclocking performance and stability. Given that memory is highly relevant for performance with new Ryzen CPUs, now is a good time to do research on high performance kits. Start with the Vengeance RGB LED kit at the link in the description below. So starting off with just the hardware on this one, it is again, $1,200 to $1,300. It includes an i7 CPU, and the GPU is a 1050 Ti. That makes this the combination of hardware pretty appealing for a smaller form factor. But again, this screen comes in at 17.3 inches, so it doesn't quite fit what, uh, what my preference would be for form factor with the components. However, we can still look at the thing as a whole. And then obviously, if you wanted a smaller one, they have smaller options with similar components. It's just the thermals and the noise will be a bit different. But that notwithstanding, let's look at the uh, solution on the inside here and then work our way around the rest of the unit. For the hard drive, this particular model at the price is one terabyte hard drive, 128 gigabyte SSD. Uh, their suppliers do change for these so they don't specify them. However, this one is actually a 128 gigabyte SSD from Toshiba. And uh, then the memory is 16 gigabytes. So this one has got two eight gigabyte DIMMs right there. For the rest of it, the cooling solution is handled by two fans. So there's a, a two fan setup, which does impact noise, as we'll see a bit later in the noise testing. One fan on each side. The CPU is oriented, is positioned here uh, on the unit, and the GPU is positioned here. And these two share a cooling solution to some extent. Now, the CPU is a bit isolated because it's got two of its copper heat pipes that feed over here and get cooled largely by this fan, whereas the GPU is going moreover uh, with these pipes, but it does have one that runs alongside the CPU cooling. And in between that line from the GPU to the my right side of the notebook, there are some of the power components. So you get the MOSFETs and the inductors over here where MSI has another aluminum plate that covers those and is connected via thermal pad. And that uh, covers most of the power components. They don't cover all of them. They've got the inductors contacted from the thermal pad to the aluminum plate and then one of the power components, one of the FETs down here, and one of the inductors is not covered. Seems a bit odd, but uh, whatever. I guess they didn't want to do it. So that's, that's the cooling design. This design actually, as we'll see in thermal testing in a moment, works pretty damn well. And the reason it does work well is because of that 17.3 inch form factor for the screen. So it's a wider notebook, which means you have more real estate to deal with the thermals. That's the biggest challenge with thermals on these things because they have more surface area to spread this out with pretty a pretty big amount of copper. I mean, that weighs you down a little bit, but the trade-off is better thermals. Uh, so that helps with cooling, but it does have a weird trade-off where because their thermal solution is flanking the battery, the battery actually ends up quite small. And that's another thing we'll look at in the battery testing. So this battery could be a bit larger and this is something that we wish MSI might consider in the future. If MSI did something like ditch this, and I know this notebook is one of the few form factors where it'll just barely fit an optical drive and people want that. Uh, well, some people anyway, but if they'll ditch this and maybe relocate some of their cooling solution, then they could run a larger battery. And that is one of the trade-offs. Uh, this, this kind of stuff gets into personal preference a bit, but with a laptop like this, my preference is better battery life and get rid of the optical drive and give me another hour of battery if you can do it. And that would be possible by re relocating some of this stuff elsewhere in the system. But let's get into the benchmarks now. We're going to start with the cooling stuff, thermals, go into noise, bridge to that, uh, talk FPS and battery as well. As always, for full testing methodology, check the link in the description below for all that detail in the article. Starting with thermals, we ran two games on loop for thermal testing in real world scenarios. We used Dirt Rally and Metro Last Light, both of which are easy to configure for endless looping and are reliable in logging. They also produce enough load on the CPU and the GPU to produce a good amount of 
thermal torturing without going to a full torture test. For the first chart, the Metro last light chart, we see CPU temperature climbs until it hits about 80 Celsius. Ambience is represented at the bottom of the chart. And we see frequency sticking to roughly 3400 megahertz for the entire test. There are no clock drops here, so no thermal throttling occurs on the CPU. Cooling is reasonable given the small form factor of the laptop, though the stretched out body does help spread that heat over a larger area. GPU cooling has us at around 68 to 70 Celsius in this particular test, which shows us dropping about 50 megahertz off the GPU clocks as time carries on. That's not too bad overall, and pretty good thermal performance when considering the CPU and GPU are sharing a very small enclosure and some of the cooling solution. Now, it does get a bit loud, but we'll talk about that in the next section. As for Dirt Rally, we see the CPU running at around 72 to 75 Celsius, with the GPU running at about 65 C. It's a lighter workload here. There's no thermal throttling on the CPU, once again, with the limited clock reductions on the GPU still present. This more or less confirms the previous results, and if you're wondering what some of the spikiness is in the frequency charts, that's just because the benchmark loops and whenever it loops, the frequency isn't as in demand. Moving into noise, this chart shows the fan curve ramping over time. This test was conducted over about a half hour period, allowing a gaming workload to run on loop for the full 30 minutes while plugged in. As is shown clearly here, we're seeing the fan curve ramp quickly into the range of 45 dBA, where idle operation sat closer to 32 dBA. Of course, this isn't the full picture with noise, the frequency is a bit higher, though we're not currently plotting a frequency spectrum analysis. The noise floor is about 26 dB of the room for reference. The laptop's fans run loud when gaming, but that won't be a problem if using headphones. It will, however, be a bit of a problem if trying to use speakers or if the fan ramps up in a more public setting where you're going to get some glances for all the wine coming out of the machine. This is something that MSI is working on with the new Max-Q laptop spec from NVIDIA, where NVIDIA is sort of enforcing a 40 dB noise output from the machines. Regardless, for the GE 72-7RE in its current form, expect about 42 to 45 dBA when gaming and about 32 dBA when idle, which is a bit louder than desired, but not terrible. For the primary battery life test, we're looking at office tasks with all the bloatware removed, and we saw a battery life of about 109 minutes when running at PC Mark Office on loop until death of the battery. The tasks included spreadsheet management, a lot of word processing, and some video playback, which would be comparable to YouTube viewing. FPS benchmarks were already shown in a separate video, but we'll recap them briefly here. If you want more detail, go check out that one. And for a summary of the 1050 Ti's results, we've got this chart. This is one without comparing to other laptops. We'll recap those in a moment. Generally speaking, the 1050 Ti and i7 combination is perfectly adequate for 1080p gaming on a notebook. And that's particularly true considering our tolerances for FPS are looser with laptops than desktops. The lower power consumption and form factor receives greater importance than increased performance in this type of use case. And we're running at least high settings on everything and seeing good performance overall. Comparatively, as we show in this old Mordor benchmark, since laptops are loners and we don't hang on to them, the 1050 Ti outpaces a 970M and sits behind a 980M. The GTX 1060 is a fairly sizable upgrade with what is about a 32% performance uplift, but may not be necessary for everyone. We can see this scale continue fairly linearly in other games too, like our Black Ops 3 benchmark. The 1050 Ti lands again between the 970M and the 1060 in this one, and our deprecated Overwatch training test. We've since replaced that with bot match testing, though detailed in our separate Overwatch graphics optimization guide, and also detailed in our 1050 Ti benchmark video for laptops initially. Being that laptops are so specific to what you need, if you need something that's a larger screen size, like 17 inches, which is really entering territory of desktop replacement, though this one's a bit lighter and smaller than most of those, if you need that screen size, it's a fine laptop and the price is pretty good. But generally speaking, this kind of uh, configuration with an i7 or something like that and a 1050 Ti would be better served in a 15 inch form factor, 15.6 inch form factor, where it's more portable, you can actually open it on a plane. This one, you really can't, can't do. I mean, if you're on a plane and you're using the laptop, you're gonna end up with it about this kind of angle on the screen, speaking from experience. Uh, so that's kind of problematic with these larger screen sizes, but again, it's something that you trade off if you're using it as, des as a desktop replacement at home. Other kind of smaller points of note that may or may not be relevant to you, the keyboard, although it is a full size keyboard with numpad support and all of that uh, does have function button requirements in order to use some things like home or end 
which are things that I use frequently when doing editing, like as in written article editing. Uh, so that's problematic for me. It may not matter for you. If that's the case, then ignore the complaint. But otherwise, when you have this much space for a keyboard, speaking personally, I'd really like to see those keys like home and end and some of the other ones on here expanded out and actually given a dedicated key on the keyboard because I have a 14 point something inch laptop that's from 2012 and it's got a better keyboard than most of the laptops on the market today, which is why I haven't upgraded. Uh, but that's, that's just on the keyboard side. Software is a problem. If you buy one of these laptops, again, the hardware is fine. Actually, the cooling solution is pretty good. It performs really well uh, under any kind of load where you're sharing the CPU and GPU in that small enclosure. But the software is terrible. So you buy, if you buy this thing, just remove it all, install Windows clean, and you have a much better experience out of box, and you're not going to have weird boot time issues. Once this has a clean OS on it, it boots in about 18 seconds, 18.4, something like that, uh, whereas the stock configuration is closer to 40 plus. So keep that in mind as well. But overall, the unit is okay. The hardware is good. Software, not so much. Let's ignore that. Just say blow it away, clean OS. Uh, the hardware is okay. Cooling solution is good. One of the better ones on the market. It just comes down to things like how much do you care about keyboard button placement and how much do you care about things like screen size and noise. Might be better to look at a smaller screen size, maybe the GE62, where you can cut off about two inches right here and uh, slightly increase the chassis height instead. Might be a better trade-off for you. But overall, as always, links in the description below. For more information, thank you for watching. You go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly or subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.